Hey guys, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So as you might be able to tell, my setup looks a little bit different than normal and that is because I actually did move into a new apartment. Now that is because my last place was absolutely roach infested. It was absolutely disgusting and the leasing office would do nothing about it. So after months of doing fumigations and getting sprayed and cleaning my entire apartment from top to bottom, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. So I decided to move. I'm actually finishing out the lease on the other place because just paying last month's rent was cheaper than breaking the lease. So here I am paying for two apartments this month which is great but at least I am not living with roaches anymore which is absolutely disgusting. So yeah that is what has been going on in my life recently but I also wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to my brand new Patreon Justin. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. I feel so grateful to even be in a position to thank you for supporting me. I appreciate you so much more than you actually know. So with all of that being said, let's just get into today's video. Today's case is yet another very frustrating case that we really just don't have any answers to. It's something that can literally happen to any of us and it really puts everything into perspective for us. So with that being said, let's just get right into it. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Rachel Cook. Rachel Cook was born May 10, 1982 in Georgetown, Texas to her parents Robert and Janet Cook. Georgetown isn't very small in terms of space, but it still had a quiet small town vibe where people had a ton of land on their properties and pretty much everyone knew everyone. It was a safe town where kids could play outside without their parents needing to hover over them and no one really even thought about locking their doors. This was seen as a great place to raise a family. Now, Rachel had a younger sister named Joanne and the family was your typical loving, close-knit family. Robert worked as a software engineer and Janet worked as a high school teacher at the local high school in Georgetown. By all accounts, Rachel had a great childhood. She spent a lot of time playing outside and being as active as possible as a child and eventually grew into this creative, smart, motivated woman who had a deep love for life and for fashion. She was described as having a very bubbly personality with big dreams and aspirations for her life. Her entire life, she was interested in fashion and running. In high school, Rachel ran long distance track and cross country. She would wake up every single morning and go on long four to six mile runs. She was very competitive with herself, always setting goals as to how fast and how far she could go. By the end of her high school career, she took her big dreams and aspirations for life all the way to San Diego, California, where she would attend the San Diego Mesa Community College to get her associate's degree before moving on to a university for a degree in fashion. Of course, this was a huge transition for this small town girl to be moving to this massive city states away, but she was so excited. Her parents had their worries, of course, but knew that she would go on to do great things. At the time when she was graduating high school and moving to San Diego, she did have a boyfriend, but decided to just end things with him before she moved because she just wanted to be on her own. She wanted to be more independent and was just excited to start this new chapter in her life without being tied down by anyone in this long distance relationship. After moving to San Diego, Rachel absolutely loved it there. She missed her family, but she knew that she was right where she belonged. It was also after moving to San Diego where she met her new boyfriend named Greg, who she met at school. Robert and Janet said that Greg was a great guy who treated Rachel very well and supported her dreams. Their relationship had got pretty serious and they thought that Greg could very well be the one. Now, Rachel had gone home to Georgetown for winter break, but Rachel and Greg had these plans to move in together and start this new chapter in their relationship when they returned back to San Diego. However, tragically, these plans would never actually happen because Rachel 
never made it back to San Diego after her break. So while she was on break, Greg actually came home with Rachel for a little bit. They had planned to go back to San Diego around New Year's, but Rachel actually decided to stay a little bit longer to attend her cousin's wedding that would be on January 12th. So Rachel stayed home in Georgetown for that, and then Greg went home a few days before New Year's. On January 8th, 2002, Rachel had gone to a party to hang out and see some of her old high school friends but also at this party was her ex-boyfriend. He had been drinking, of course, and started to talk to Rachel in a pretty normal and casual way, but as the two kept on talking, he started telling her how much he wanted to get back together with her and how much he missed her. She was trying to be nice the entire time, but was still turning him down. She told him that she did have a new boyfriend and that the two were building their new lives together. Again, she was trying to be as nice as possible while being stern as possible. But either way, he was not taking this very well at all. All. Witnesses reported hearing the ex-boyfriend saying that he didn't want to live without her. Of course, she was incredibly uncomfortable by this and didn't want to be mean, but she kind of had to be at this point. She had to be firm and tell him that they were not going to get back together. By the end of the party, Rachel went home as normal, but she was feeling kind of bad for putting her foot down and telling her ex-boyfriend no. Now, like I said earlier, Rachel was going to attend her cousin's wedding, but she hadn't really planned for it, so she didn't pack an outfit to wear. So she asked her dad to take her shopping, and the two planned to go shopping on January 10th. She had also reached out to her best friend, Shannon, to hang out on the 10th as well. Now, January 10th came and started as a pretty normal day. Robert, Janet, and Joanne sat at the breakfast table together while Rachel slept on the couch. Robert left for work at around 8 a.m. while Rachel was still sleeping. Janet and Joanne left shortly after, just before 9 a.m., waking up Rachel to say goodbye. They said by the time that they left, Rachel was waking up, but she was kind of groggy, just kind of mumbling goodbye to them. Joanne and Janet went to the high school together since Janet worked there and Joanne attended school there. Then at around 9 a.m., Greg called Rachel and the two had a pretty normal conversation, probably just saying good morning and talking about their plans for the day. Rachel told Greg that she was about to get up to go on her morning run and then by 9.15 a.m., the two hung up and Rachel got ready to go. She put on a bright green sports bra, a gray t-shirt, gray shorts, and white shoes. She took her yellow Walkman and her headphones so she could listen to music as she ran. It is thought that she left the home at around 9.30 a.m. to head out on her run. A witness did see her running about 200 yards away from her home, but after this, no one would see her ever again. Now, Robert got home from work at around 3 p.m. that day, expecting to see Rachel at home since they were supposed to go shopping that day, but she was nowhere to be found. He started looking around for her, and when he got to the living room, he saw that she had some clothes spread out across the living room as if she was deciding what to wear that day. He wasn't completely panicked at first because he knew that Rachel did have plans to hang out with her friend Shannon that day and thought that maybe Shannon had just picked her up early. But soon he realized that Rachel's purse and her cell phone were still at home and this is when Robert started to get worried. Of course, the first thing he did was call Shannon to see if she had been hanging out with Rachel. She told him that they did have plans to hang out later, but that she hadn't seen Rachel yet. Robert told Shannon that Rachel was gone and hadn't taken anything with her, and this is when Shannon started to get worried as well. By the time Janet got home, Robert asked her if she knew about any plans that Rachel may have had. Now, on on her breaks from school, Rachel would pick up some shifts at a nearby restaurant called Wildfire, so Janet thought that maybe she had just been working that evening and forgot her stuff at home. So they called the Wildfire to see if she had a shift that night, and an employee did confirm that she was working a shift that night. So this is where they thought that she was, so 
the family pretty much went on with their evening as normal. However, by that next morning, Rachel still hadn't returned home and all of her belongings were exactly where they had been in the day previously. Janet called the restaurant back again to see if Rachel had actually shown up for work that night and again, they said she did, but it turned out that there was actually a bit of confusion with the call the night before. Turns out that there was a different Rachel who was working that night, not Rachel Cook. This is when they realized that no one had actually seen Rachel since they left that morning and they immediately went into a panic. They frantically started going through Rachel's belongings and realized that the only clothes missing were her running clothes that I mentioned earlier. Her green sports bra, her gray shirt and shorts, and her white shoes. After realizing this, they went out to search for her. Janet went to the local hospital to see if Rachel or any other unidentified females had been there, but they found that neither Rachel or any unidentified females were there. Robert drove around the four mile route that Rachel normally took to see if she had possibly been injured or if he could find any trace of her running clothes or the yellow Walkman that she took, but they found absolutely no sign of her anywhere. By 2 p.m. on Friday, January 11th, 2002, Rachel's parents went to the Williamson County Sheriff's Office to officially file a missing persons report. They told police the route she took, what she was last doing before she went missing, what she was wearing, and any details surrounding her disappearance that they could think of. But missing persons cases was not something that police in this small town dealt with. Someone going missing in this area was completely unheard of, so they were not prepared to take on a case like this. So as Robert and Janet were expressing their concerns to the police, they felt like they weren't being taken seriously. Apparently, police were basically trying to say that she ran off with her boyfriend and that she wasn't really missing. It seemed like they were just trying to spin this into a situation where they didn't actually have to put in any effort towards actually finding her. By the end of their visit to the police station, detectives told them that they would be contacted soon. However, Hours passed and no one had bothered to reach out. They were starting to get really frustrated with police and their lack of interest in this case, so they decided to start doing their own investigation. They started calling around trying to gather volunteers in the search for Rachel. They gathered hundreds of volunteers to walk the route that Rachel would normally run, as well as other areas in Georgetown that they could scour. As the volunteers were searching though, an investigator showed up and told the family that this search needs to stop immediately. He basically said that there's so many people walking around that any evidence that could be there may be lost, which I understand, but if they would have just done something from the very beginning, you know, gave them advice on how to proceed until someone gets into contact with them, instead of just leaving them to sit there and worry about their daughter, things may have gone differently. But either way, when police finally got involved, they started interviewing the people around the neighborhood and found several witnesses who actually did see her that morning. One couple who was walking around the neighborhood said that Rachel had passed them running once at 10 a.m. and then passed them again running at around 10.20 a.m. Another woman who was working in her garden saw Rachel down the street from Rachel's home stretching, saying that Rachel waved at them. Lastly, a couple that lived about 200 yards away from the Cook home said that as they were backing their car down the driveway, they saw Rachel running past the car towards the Cook home. And this was at about 10.45 a.m. So she was literally 200 yards away from her home the last time she was seen. Now, other witnesses reported seeing other suspicious activity in the neighborhood the morning that Rachel was last seen. Like I said earlier, this was a very small town neighborhood where everyone knew everyone. 
it wasn't common to see someone that you didn't know driving down the streets or around the neighborhood. However, on January 10th, multiple witnesses claimed seeing vehicles that they didn't recognize driving around their neighborhood. One of these vehicles was a late model white Camaro driven by a man described as being in his late teens to early 20s with dark slicked back hair. One witness said that there was another man sitting in the front seat of this car. Another witness claimed that this car stopped and talked to a jogger. Yet another witness came forward claiming to see that a woman was riding in the back of the car looking to be in distress. But none of these witnesses could identify any of the people in question, including the jogger or the woman in the back seat. Others stated that they witnessed a white Pontiac Trans Am with a similar description and similar occurrences. Another car witnesses claimed to see driving around the neighborhood was a white truck. They said that this truck was driving around the neighborhood and then slowed down once they spotted the jogger and said that the person driving the car looked like they were trying to speak to the jogger. Again, this jogger was not confirmed to be Rachel, but it was a very small town and there weren't a ton of different people jogging around, so it is very possible that this was Rachel because all of these witnesses claim that they saw these cars talking to the jogger around the same time that Rachel was known to be jogging. At this point, police started to believe that this definitely seemed very suspicious and realized that Rachel probably did not just leave willingly. They ran searches on these cars to see if they could find any matches and reached out to the Texas Rangers to help with the case. After the Texas Rangers arrived, Rachel's parents felt that this case was going to be taken a lot more seriously. They executed exhaustive searches, including ATVs, helicopters, horses, sniffer dogs, and sonar equipment to search the waters, and hundreds of volunteers to search on foot. One lake in particular that they searched was Lake Georgetown, which took up about a thousand acres and is about 85 feet Deep. They used dive teams to scour the lake and found a bunch of submerged vehicles that came back being stolen, but were stolen long before the day that Rachel went missing and were not connected to Rachel. Despite searching for days upon days around the entire neighborhood and surrounding area, absolutely no trace of Rachel was found anywhere. It seemed like she was literally plucked off the earth with absolutely no sign of anything. After several days, police stopped their searches, but local volunteers and an organization called EquiSearch continued searching the area and expanding the search radius each day. They searched hundreds of miles of land, but found nothing useful. Eventually, the media got a hold of Rachel's case, and finally, more tips started coming in. People were finally coming forward with more information, and police started to find more possible persons of interest. One of which, of course, being Rachel's ex-boyfriend. If we remember from earlier, just a few days before Rachel's disappearance, the two had gotten into a huge fight with him making a huge scene, saying that he could not live without her. The Cook family even came forward at one point saying that this ex-boyfriend came over to their house completely intoxicated, banging on the door at 3 a.m. demanding to speak to Rachel. It got to the point where they had to call police to get him to leave because they told him to leave and he just wouldn't. Police did follow the lead connecting the ex-boyfriend to the disappearance, but weren't able to find anything actually connecting him. He wasn't known to be seen anywhere in the area when she went missing, and there was no other link besides these arguments that could connect him to her disappearance. Now, as they were following all of these different leads, they were actually able to track down the suspicious vehicles in question that morning. All of these cars were searched and examined but nothing was found connecting to Rachel. They tried to come up with sketches of the different people thought to have been driving the cars and that could be connected to Rachel's disappearance, but no one came forward with any knowledge of who these men were. With nothing else to go off of, police did start looking into the Cook 
family. Greg, her current boyfriend, was back in Texas to help with the searches, so police questioned him, but phone records do confirm that he was in San Diego on January 10th. Janet and Robert both took polygraph tests and passed, but during Robert's polygraph test, he was asked if he knew where Rachel was and there was an issue with his answer. Now, Robert just said that when he was asked if he knew where she was, he said that he didn't know where she was, but deep down, he thinks that she's in heaven and that's why he messed up that question. They looked more into Rachel's parents, but they were completely cooperative the entire time. Ultimately, they were found to have no connection to Rachel's disappearance. Robert and Janet continued to search for Rachel. They went on the media to spread information. They did everything that they could to try and figure out what happened to Rachel, but they could not find anything. Of course, Rachel's disappearance had a profound impact on their lives and it became too much to handle. It was absolutely tragic and they were beginning to become hopeless. By the one year anniversary of Rachel's disappearance, the family felt that all hope was lost and they didn't know what to do anymore. They continued searching throughout the years. They searched Georgetown Lake numerous times. They had hundreds of volunteers coming out to help. They put out billboards, they put out cash rewards, but nothing helped. Now, by 2004, two years after the disappearance, a new sheriff was elected in Georgetown and he put new effort into Rachel's case. They gathered additional resources and looked once more into her case. This is also when the family started working with the National Center for Missing Adults who revamped the search efforts. The family also appeared on the John Wall Show to talk about Rachel. But again, even with the family's tireless efforts and endless searches, they were no closer to finding Rachel than they were at the very beginning. Then in 2006, the case was once again in the headlines when a man and convicted felon named Michael Moore confessed to harming Rachel. He was already in jail for taking the life of another young woman and was serving four life sentences for it. He said that the morning she went missing, he was driving around the neighborhood looking for somewhere to rob when he spotted Rachel. He said that he hit Rachel with a hammer and then dumped her body in the Gulf of Mexico. Investigators on Rachel's case did go to interview him and he basically told them what happened that day and even said that he was driving the white pickup truck that day, which was one of the suspicious vehicles that was seen that day. He told them where he took her and agreed to show investigators the exact location of where he dumped her in the Gulf of Mexico. Of course, divers went and searched for her on numerous locations, but they didn't find her. And they thought, you know, maybe she just drifted somewhere else and that's why she wasn't in that exact location. Then he went to court to testify the exact details of what he had done, but when he actually got in front of the judge and jury, he actually pleaded not guilty. He said that he only admitted to this crime because he was given special privileges as he was telling them what happened and blamed investigators for not realizing that he was just straight up making everything up. Of course, everyone was absolutely devastated because of this because the family thought that they were finally going to get closure. A lot of people were unsure whether to believe that he was involved or not, but I personally think that he is not. He went on to do numerous interviews, go out and say that he was involved, and then said that he wasn't involved and kept changing his mind and put this family onto an absolute roller coaster every time he came out and said something. He was just trying to use everyone to get special advantages and privileges. I just think that this is some narcissistic scumbag who will use 
absolutely anything and absolutely anyone to put himself into a better position, and I don't think that he was involved whatsoever. The family continues to go through a roller coaster of emotions throughout the years. Since the day that Rachel went missing, eight bodies have been found in Williamson County, and every time they just have to sit there and wait for DNA testing to come back, not knowing what to hope for. On one end, if they get a body, they can finally get some closure as to where she is and lay her body to rest, but then on the other side, not knowing what happened to her can still leave them with the hope that she's still alive out there somewhere. Robert never gave up searching for his daughter. He went out over and over again to share Rachel's story, get her name out there, and advocate for her. He had dedicated his entire life to finding her, but unfortunately, he would never go on to live to find out what happened to his daughter. On November 5th, 2014, at the age of 59 years old, Robert passed away. Despite his passing, though, his legacy would live on. Not only did he search tirelessly for Rachel, but he advocated for other missing persons. He helped in numerous other searches for missing persons, and he even set up a self-defense class for women. He advocated for the families of missing persons, and until the day that he died, he never stopped his search. Rachel's case has continued to be investigated in the years after. A huge break came in this case in 2018, 16 years after Rachel's disappearance, when police actually were able to track down the white Pontiac Trans Am that they believed could have been connected to Rachel and another young woman who went missing in the same area. It can also be connected to three or four of the persons of interest in this case. They searched and examined this car and actually found traces of blood on the passenger floorboard and inside the passenger door. They ran this blood for DNA, but we don't yet know the results of this test. It may be possible that they aren't releasing the results because it's important to the investigation that they keep this a secret, but either way, they have stated that this blood and this car are vital to the investigation. They say that it's not an absolute nail in the coffin break to the case, but they remain very hopeful. Janet has been cautiously hopeful after finding out this information because she doesn't want to get her hopes up too high if this doesn't pan out, but is also happy that they are finally seeing movement in this case. So that is pretty much where the information in this case ends. When it comes to the car, I'm sure investigators are working on leads that we just don't know about, and as soon as I see an update with that information, I will let you all know. So now we are going to get into the theories on this case. Of course, the first theory is that Rachel's ex-boyfriend is responsible for her disappearance. We know that they were arguing just two days before her disappearance where he was so desperate for her saying that he absolutely could not live without her. We know that at one point, I'm not sure of the exact date, but at one point he showed up to the family home drunk and banging on the door and would not leave until police showed up and forced him to leave. We don't know what kind of car he drove and we don't really have any other information pointing towards him, but it's just so strange how this argument happened just before she went missing. He knew that she went on these runs. He probably knew the route that she took since he was dating her in high school and she probably went on the same route when she got home from college. So it's very possible that he was driving around the neighborhood and just waiting until he saw her. It's also possible that he brought other friends with him who she may or may not have known to help him since we know that there were some other unidentified males in the area. The other theory is that someone else is responsible. Now, this is a pretty small town and there aren't really many people passing through the area who are not familiar with the area. In order to even 
be in this neighborhood, the person would need to know the area pretty well, which means that someone who lives there or who lived there at some point would have to be responsible. There is always the possibility of human trafficking, of course, but to me, with how this town is, I just don't think that it's the most likely case since they typically go to more populated areas closer to highways as we've seen in so many of these other cases, just like with the Tiffany Daniels case in Pensacola where it's very possible because she lived next to such a huge highway. But with this case, it's such a small town that I feel like traffickers would know how dangerous it would be to go here because they're going to be seen. They're going to be known as people who don't belong there. So I just don't think that human trafficking is an option in this case. So that makes me think that someone else who lived near or in the neighborhood is responsible. We don't know who police are suspecting right now or where the evidence has pointed them, but I think that whoever is responsible was driving one of those suspicious cars, if not the white Trans Am that they have. It is possible that there is someone in the neighborhood who is going around and harming other women because like I said earlier, the car is also connected to the disappearance of another young woman. Police haven't released the names or the relationship to Rachel of the people that they have in mind as suspects, so it's hard to come up with an actual theory of who it could be besides just saying that it's someone other than the ex-boyfriend who is responsible. So as of right now, those are pretty much the two main theories, is that the ex-boyfriend was responsible or that someone else in the area was responsible. As for whether I think she's alive or not, I don't know. I think if the ex-boyfriend is responsible, I wouldn't think that she is alive any longer. I don't think that with him being looked into so much that he would be able to just hide a person. I think that he would have taken her and then put her body into some sort of water. If someone other than the ex-boyfriend is responsible, I do think it's possible that they have been holding her all of these years because, again, police haven't really been looking into their direction as far as we know so it could be possible. We've seen women who everyone just assumes are gone showing up five or 10 or 20 years later after being in captivity. It's always possible that any of the people we talk about going missing, it's always possible that that's the case for them too and with Rachel, but it's also possible and probably more likely that she is no longer alive, but it's hard to say. I think it is helpful that we have a complete timeline of what happened, but I'm really interested to find out what this new car evidence is and if it will actually solve the case. That is what gives me hope in Rachel's case. Investigators seem very confident that this car is vital to the case and they would not come out and just say that if they didn't have some good evidence from this car. I just hope that whatever they find in this white Pontiac Trans Am is what points them to finding out exactly what happened to Rachel and allows the family to finally receive the justice and the closure that they so desperately need. Rachel was only 19 years old when she went missing from Georgetown, Texas on January 10th, 2002. She was described as being five foot two inches tall, 120 pounds, having blonde hair with hazel eyes. She was last seen wearing a bright green sports bra, a gray t-shirt, gray shorts, and white tennis shoes with a yellow Walkman. If you have absolutely any information, they ask that you contact the FBI at 1-800-225 5324. So that is all I have for today's video. So now I want to know what you guys think. Do you think that the ex-boyfriend is responsible or do you think that it's someone else? 
Or do you think that something completely different happened that we're not even thinking of? Please let me know in the comments below. With that being said, if you liked today's video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please do not hesitate to send them to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I receive, so please do not be afraid to send them over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!